you are very welcome to today's video. I want to start off with a bit of sort of global contextualization, really. What is going on in the world? So let's start off by looking at some um, figures, all adjusted for the size of the population. So these are adjusted for population size. Now, we do see a bit of a reduction in new cases in the UK, and that does appear to be genuine, whereas the United States were still basically going up. But interesting to note, the UK has more cases per capita than the United States, and Canada, of course, is doing uh, much better than either of our countries. So new daily confirmed cases, COVID-19 per million again, and this is for the Americas. So we see the United States with way more cases per capita than Brazil, Bolivia and Mexico, for, for example. Or do we? Because this is the testing. Now, this drop off in testing in the States here is artifactual. That's not real. We'll see evidence for that later. But look at Brazil, Bolivia, Mexico. I mean, basically, these countries aren't testing. So we don't know what's going on there. But we do believe there are a lot of cases from the reports that we're getting. So um, basically, the official data there means nothing. So th those numbers mean essentially nothing. The United States, it means a lot because the testing there is good. But for these countries that appear to be less affected, well, from the data, we simply can't tell. So always very important to take this in the context of the testing that's being done there. Otherwise, it's pretty well meaningless. But I think most of the countries we're going to look at now have got fairly good levels of testing. Now, Israel in the United Kingdom, interesting. Very similar increases in cases. Um, round about the same levels per capita. Now, the reason I put this one up was in Israel, the vaccination program is well on, but it's not yet reflected in the reduction in the number of new cases. So it's not really kicking in yet even though I think we'll see the data later. I think they're up to about 15% of the population vaccinated. So doing well, but not really having the, uh, the beneficial effect yet and not having this herd immunity effect yet that we would like. So very comparable uh, countries there in terms of per capita cases. Now, this is just a bit of a disaster unfolding in Ireland, unfortunately. Um, now, Republic of Ireland at the moment has the highest number of cases per capita in the world the, 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 of all the countries that are doing any testing anyway. So very, very rapid increase in, uh, in Ireland there. Now, why is this? Um, partly it's due to um, celebrations that occurred over Christmas. Anecdotally, we've heard there's, there's more mixing than we would like in, in Ireland over the Christmas and New Year period. And also it's looking like about 50% of the cases in Ireland now are the new variant that was first identified in the UK. Where it came from, we don't know. Um, Ireland are just starting to increase their genomic testing now. So double whammy there, mixing over Christmas with the new variant, essentially guaranteed spread because this is why I've had so many new cases in the UK because of this wretched new variant that's reared its incredibly ugly head. So Ireland, um, highest per capita in the world at the moment. Quite concerning, really. And, and we know that the healthcare provision in Ireland is really quite limited. What is going to happen there? These cases, as we've looked at, repeatedly are going to feed through the hospitalizations, and the, the facilities are simply not there for the volume of people that will require hospital care. So what is going to happen it is by no means clear and, and certainly, certainly a concern. Many of us, of course, have uh, relatives from, from Ireland. Uh, that were, were, they're diffused around the world. M my, my family left there during the potato famine, for example. Not that you wanted to know that. Anyway, uh, back to the point. Um, United Kingdom and Spain. Spain dramatically increasing now. I, I put the United Kingdom on just as kind of a reference point there. But the trajectory certainly straight up in Spain. And Portugal, well, the lines just speak for themselves, don't they? A dramatic increase in Portugal, no evidence of levelling off at the moment. Again, it's going to feed through to cases, severe cases, 
hospitalizations and again the, the healthcare provision in Portugal is going to really really struggle to cope with this I'm not sure what is going to happen so another grave concern there uh, Chechia uh, the country that used to be called the Czech Republic again massive increase in cases more than the United Kingdom it's going to feed through into huge hospitalizations and again I don't know what is going to happen it's it's going to be very very difficult I suspect people are going to die who would have been saved had medical treatment been available. This is what we've feared for the last, getting on for a year now in this pandemic, we've been talking about this. Um, and now it's it's happening, uh, ironically, as we get so near the vaccination stage. Sweden cases have gone dramatically up. Now, many people have argued about Sweden no, I, I, I got emails for months. Why aren't you talking about Sweden? Why do you refuse to talk about Sweden? Why are you lying about Sweden? Well, well, here we have the evidence. The strategy that Sweden pursued in the early stages for herd immunity has not worked. We can now state that. No, I, I won't state that. This graph states that. This graph is stating that that herd immunity strategy did not work. The cases are not that far behind the United Kingdom, unfortunately. Um, Netherlands and Denmark, I put this on because they're much more uh, encouraging. Uh, their measures have brought cases down. Now, Netherlands and Denmark. Now, Denmark did have this problem, of course, with the new strain from mink. But they seem to have got that under control. We've heard nothing else about that for weeks now. And as far as we know, they don't have a lot of the, uh, the, the UK identified variants. So that's encouraging that their measures are working. What would be concerning if the new variant does crop up there, then that could make them follow the same uh, trajectory as the, as the United Kingdom. So some interesting, some interesting graphics there just for, for context. Now, um, we haven't looked at Canada for a while, so let's just have a quick look at uh, the situation in Canada. Now, Canada really, um, it more or less speaks for itself because the... Um, the uh, the website is so excellent for Canada. So, so, so there we see it and it gives us the graph. Now, Nunavut was a concern with its uh, First Nation population. I'm glad to see the numbers have leveled out there and remain relatively low. But we see along the southern states of Canada, the, the trajectory is, is quite steeply up. If we look at the graph on the right, um, Quebec uh, most severely affected. Um, Ontario, you, you see that for yourself. Now, the problem with the Canada website, uh, as I say satirically, is that, is that when you're on it, it's um, it's such a well done website that I'm always uh, pretty well compelled to go to the whole world um, map here that the Canadian authorities maintain, where we see all the countries of the world. And again, if we look at this graphic here, we get the direction of the trend. So you know, if we look at Mexico, where those cases seem to be so low, well, that that, that speaks... Well, again, that, 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 those cases are based on completely inadequate testing and steal them up. So what the situation is in South America, Mex in Mexico, we don't really know for sure. Um, Canada, we've looked at. Um, United Kingdom, let's just remind ourselves what we're looking at here. Num number of COVID cases, these are total cases. Uh, and the direction. Oh, look at that. Turkey's had a dramatic increase. Wow. I wasn't aware of that. Very dramatic increase. Uh, India. Um, Russia. China's actually had a few cases. Uh, I think it's well controlled. France, quite dramatic increase. The UK we know about. It's probably a slight levelling off. So um, <clears throat> that's the Canada website. Um do go on it for yourself, um, and uh, it's, it's very interesting and, and uh, very informative. Uh, now, getting back to the main topics today, United States. Um, just a quick look at the uh, the overall picture there from the states. The upward trend continues. Now, the new variant has been found in quite a few places in the states. But there's no evidence to suggest that these new, more infectious variants from South Africa and the UK have uh, become established in the United States. But I fear they will because of simple evolutionary pressures. The, the new UK identified variant 
outcompetes with the old variant. So I suspect the prevalence of that in the United States is going to increase. And when that happens, we will get dramatic increases in the incidence in the United States. Unfortunately, that would be my current uh, prediction. But what we know for now, 193,000 new cases in a 24 hour period, very high increase in new cases. That's an 8.3% increase in new cases in the past seven days. This is in the background of good levels of testing in the States, nearly 2 million per day. Again, up, it's been up for weeks now, it's up another 5.1% in testing in the past seven days, indicating that these numbers are, are uh, well, not accurate, but, but highly representative, highly representative. National positivity is 13% now. This is, what this means is, as you know, that 13% of samples taken are coming back positive, meaning there's a lot of community spread, a lot of community spread. And my concern is as the new variant becomes increasingly established in the United States, and I chose those words carefully, as the new variant becomes progressively more established in the United States, as it will, that number is going to increase, I fear, dramatically, as it has done in Ireland, as it has done in the United Kingdom. Let these countries of Ireland and the United Kingdom be a lesson to the planners in the United States. That's what will happen. Hospitalizations in the States, nearly 130,000. That's intensive care. Glad to see that the ventilated number is not increasing. Deaths, of course, continues to increase. Now, vaccinations in the United States. Um, well, I mean, there's serious questions to be answered here, isn't there? Serious questions. I mean, I'm afraid warp speed has become a bit of a... We made the joke about propulsion power from Star Trek, but it is seriously unimpressive. We were promised or expected 20 million doses to be given um, in 2020. We're now, what is it now, the 12th of January, I think, and we're up to under 9 million doses. OK, it'll be 9 million doses today. Poor. Now, another question needs to be asked in the United States... Why is the FDA saying nothing about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that can be transported around the country at normal fridge temperatures and of which the United States has ordered 300 million doses? That question really needs to be asked of the Operation Warp Speed leadership and it needs to be asked of the FDA. And indeed, it needs to be asked of anyone in control in the United States. The data available in, to the FDA, as far as I understand it, is the same as the data available to the UK and other countries that have approved the Oxford vaccine, and yet we hear nothing. It is a deafening silence. We need that question answered. I don't understand what's going on. What is the delay? And indeed, with the European Medicines Agency, they haven't done it either. I mean, this is just... Yeah, don't get it. Don't get it. Second dose, um, so um, first dose, 9 million. Second dose, um, 344,000, representing 0.11% of the US population. But all vaccine supplies are to be released. Looks like new thinking has been established uh, today on this. Now, um, the news reports are saying that uh, the Trump administration to urge states to provide shots to anyone 65 and older, good, and they're not holding back the 50% anymore for the second dose. That's going to make 40 million doses available, we believe. Now, this is a major change of uh, tack from um, the, the central government in the United States. They want to get all these doses out to give as many people a first dose as possible. More similar to the strategy in the UK, <clears throat> has to be said. But um, the United States are still planning to give everyone their second dose by increasing manufacturing. Um, I, I'm pleased to see this change. We shouldn't be having vaccines on the shelf when people are getting ill and dying. We need to get these things out. So that's encouraging. And of course, we know as well that the Biden administration has already committed to doing this. So uh, the fact that this is being done in the, the closing days of the Trump administration um, should accelerate this programme ready for the beginning of the Biden administration, who's already committed to this uh, new new policy, this revamped policy. And it is quite a significant change. 
and uh, it's one I approve of. Now, um, good news for the United States, greenhouse gas emissions are down 10% in 2020. So um, now people would say that's because economic activity has crashed, which is uh, also true, or, or there's truth in that, but um, that is at one point of good news. Uh, not what we're doing today, though. Now, United Kingdom. Um, so this is from the government. Um, yesterday, 46,000 new cases. New Number of new cases down a bit in the UK. Now, this is encouraging. Here we see the, the official data, and there is definitely a tailing off now. We can see that line now. The black line, the darker coloured line there, of course, is the seven-day average. Still very high, still basically 60,000 new cases. Now, this will feed through to about um, a third of an increase in hospitalizations in the next few weeks. It's going to be immensely difficult for the next few weeks because all of these cases here are going to be feeding through. And it's not as if we're down to low levels now, we're still on high levels. So, um, still on very high levels. This data is a little delayed now. And this data is slightly more up to date. So the number of new cases down a little bit, encouraging signs, but still, still that's a very high number of new cases. And of course, that will feed through to hospitalizations. It's down, but it's still very high. Last seven days, total new cases, 404,000. That's up 5.5% on the week before. Um, testing in the UK, um, over 600,000 tests per day. So that's going reasonably well. Um, the last seven days, there was uh, th nearly three and a half million tests, up 32%. So, so that's good. Right, hospitalizations in the UK, high. Another 4,193, 32,000. This is immensely, immensely difficult. And we've looked at the difficulties in the past few days, so we're not going to dwell on it today, but... It's still fair to say that many hospitals and many areas are in a, a crisis at the moment and the numbers will go on increasing for the next week or two or three. The worst time is just about to come. Hospitalizations up 34% in the last seven days. That was the total number of hospitalizations in the last seven days. So... 26,836 people hospitalised in the last week. Deaths um, slightly down on what they have been, but still reached 81,000 now. And that figure is up. Uh, so that's the number of deaths within the past seven days, 6,845. That's 6,485 deaths within 28 days of a uh, positive uh, test for COVID-19 virus. SARS coronavirus 2, increasing 50% in the week. So that is still remarkably high. So that, that, that death figure there, 81,000 is the death figure for people after they have been uh, diagnosed. This is the death figure here, now updated for people who uh, have death mentioned on the death certificate, that COVID-19 is mentioned as a factor on the death certificate. So um, the real number of deaths we see is between, probably nearer than 93,000 actually, rather than the, rather than the uh, 81,000. Um, now, the number of excess deaths in the UK is, uh, is tragically high at the moment as well. So let's look at that. Um, there we go. So this is deaths compared to the five-year average. So this is the five-year average here, this line here at zero. And we see that in 2020, um, deaths were about 15% above the five-year average. And the last time deaths were in this high was in wartime, when people were getting killed by bombs and bullets and uh, drowning and all the disastrous things that went on in the Second World War. But we're approaching that kind of level now. Now, this is data from the Office for National Statistics. Number of deaths registered by week, England and Wales. So this is just England and Wales now. The previous slide was all of UK. So that was uh, data for all of the UK combined. 
This is data for just England and Wales. Um, so the, uh, the dotted line is the five-year average. The green are deaths from non-COVID causes and the blues are deaths from COVID causes. So we can see that the excess deaths here are mostly caused by COVID. The blue lines are the longest columns. And this shows the number of deaths in 2020 exceeding the five-year average in age groups. It was higher in all age groups above the age of 15. So what we have here, this top line is all deaths. Um, that's the five-year average of deaths and that's the COVID-19 deaths. And we see that this is true in all ages, albeit to very uh, variable amounts. Thankfully, the COVID-19 deaths in the younger age groups are very low. So all that data is available from the Office for National Statistics uh, website. Um, do, do log on, ha have a look, um, plenty of interesting, interesting data there. And when we look at the COVID symptom tracker app, which we like to look at as well, we do see, we are starting to see the dots getting closer together and starting to level off. This is the prevalence of symptomatic people at any one time. So there is early indications that what we are doing is, is working. It needs to work more though, because we've got a long way to go. So excess deaths in 2020. So um, England, uh, de total deaths in for 2020 were 575,000 in England. Five-year average is 503,000. So you can clearly see that that number is higher than that number um, by uh, 71,000 deaths. That's for England and, and Wales. For the UK as a whole, um, approximate deaths, uh, 697,000 excess deaths, 91,000 approximately. So it's an increase of excess deaths of 15% on a normal on a normal year given the last five year average. And uh, 2021, there's going to be a lot of excess deaths as well. These are UK figures, but they will be comparable in other European and uh, Western countries such as the United States and Canada. Canada less less numbers overall, thankfully. Um, now Ireland, as we mentioned before, highest per capita prevalence anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. Quite incredible. So Ireland has the highest prevalence in highest number of new cases in the world for reasons that we looked at. Uh, now, the testing is just ramping up in Ireland for, for genomic sequencing. But one study, did, they did 92 tests, testing doing genomic testing in Ireland, and 42 of those, so what we're getting on for about, what, 45% or something, with a new variant. So if that's accurate, 42 out of 92 with a new variant, the 2012 variant. And we know that this simply spreads like wildfire. And that is what's happening in Ireland now. If you're watching in the United States, please, please learn from the disaster that is currently unfolding in Ireland. This is what happens when the new variant becomes established. It's 55% more transmissible. This is probably going to happen in the United States. Unless you are very proactive about it, you have a relatively short time period. You know, I've been, I've, been, I've been saying this sort of thing. I've been making these warnings. And I get accused of scaremongering everything. You know, I was warning about this pandemic back in last January, February. And uh, I'm really concerned that the United States, now this new variant become established and it'll just take off. That is my real worry. Please be proactive and get people to act on this. Um, now, uh, this was interesting. Um, people who've had the infection already in Ireland... They're talking about postponing their uh, vaccination. Now, I actually warm to this idea quite a lot um, because the vaccination programme in Europe has got off to an appalling start. We might have a look at that. Um, I don't think I've put it up today, but, but m m many European countries, the vaccination levels are still very, very low. I'm, I've got a link here. I haven't loaded it myself, but you can have a look at it. We'll look at it tomorrow. Um, but, but a very poor start. And of course, Ireland is, is completely um, part of the, uh, the European Union area. So um, 
is dependent on the European vaccine supply. And they are just not enough, not enough. So it's severely short of vaccines for the, in compared to the size of the population. So uh, National Immunisation Advisory Committee, uh, so this lady here is in charge, and this is a direct quote. There is a suggestion coming out that if you've had COVID-19, you might be fairly well protected for six months. Now, I agree with this. We have looked at studies. There was a big study done in healthcare professionals in Newcastle upon time in the United Kingdom in Northumberland, not that far from me, um, uh, where we saw that healthcare professionals who were infected were enjoying very high levels of immunity and not getting sick six, seven, eight months after they were infected. So it's looking now like uh, protection lasts for at least uh, eight months. Now, again, um, I, I've actually been predicting this for for for, for well, about, about nine, ten months now. And the reason I've been predicting it is that the virus which is most similar to the SARS coronavirus 2 in terms of protein structure is the SARS coronavirus 1. So when people were talking about uh, individuals developing very low levels of immunity to SARS coronavirus 2. I said, no, I don't think so. The best analogy we've got is the SARS coronavirus 1. And people that had SARS coronavirus 1 infection in 2003 are still immune now, 17 or 18 years later. That's why I've always, well, one of the reasons I've always believed that the protection, if you've had SARS coronavirus 2, will be long lasting. Now, will it last for five years? I don't know. Will it last for four years? I don't know. All we know is it lasts for eight months because that's the only time we've had. But so far, I'm, I'm, I think that's looking good. So this strategy in Ireland, to me, um, could save, I think there's potential here to save lives because uh, it'll mean more vaccine for, for other people. Now, we'll have a quick look at Sweden just before we finish today. Uh, now, this is the Swedish government's site. This is the official site. Um, and they're saying that their aim is to limit the spread of infection in the community, ensure health care resources are available, limit the impact on critical services, alleviate the impact on people and companies, ease concern, for example, by providing information, ensure that the right measures are taken at the right time. Now, um, I agree with these, and I also like apple pie and think motherhood is a really good idea. You know, what are they saying here? It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just not saying much at all. And, and I, have, I, I had a good while looking around this morning. I couldn't find much in the way of um, data on, on the official site. So um, extends advice against all non-essential travel. We agree with that. Ban on entry into Sweden from the United Kingdom and Denmark. We agree with that. Um, and other than that, there didn't seem to be much in the way of data. Certainly not a, a Canadian style quality uh, website. So a uh, bit disappointing there. But of course, they've gone to the, uh, they've had the civility to, to publish in English, which of course I'd be pretty lost if it was in Swedish. So that, that's good. But not a lot of hard data coming out of Sweden. So that's the Swedish government sites for you to check out for yourself. Now I'm going to read an email now from uh, Tobias. Now I'm not revealing Tobias's identity but I do know who he is. I live in Sweden, the now legendary country who took a different path to battle COVID-19. Well we now know it did not work and he's put not in like big capital letters there, it did not work and I agree with Tobias. The feeling is rather tense right now and we have every possible strain so they have the uh, UK variant and the South African variant. Now, both of these, we know the UK variant, so-called, is more transmissible. The South Africa variant is looking more transmissible as well. And uh, it appears, according to Tobias's information, that they have both of these strains. If they're both there already, they will greatly increase in prevalence because of simple evolution, survival of the fittest. It is that simple. This is simple Darwinian evolution principles of survival of the fittest dictates that the variant forms of the virus being more transmissible will become the most prevalent forms of the virus. Please note that we still have up to this point never had a lockdown. 
Um, one thing I did notice on the Swedish website, they're limiting meetings to eight people. I mean, this is just laughable. Eight people? You know, seven people could become infected in one meeting. You know, it really is quite incredible what they're not doing. Uh, I write to you because my hometown, and I've, I've withheld that, 100,000 people, is having a big rise in infections at the moment. Approximately 50% of the care home report infections. There's a lot of people died in care homes, I believe, unnecessarily in, uh, in Sweden. And we did interview a Swedish doctor about that at the time. Uh, the southern part of Sweden, uh, Malmö, Helsingborg, is at the moment far worse in this second wave than the first, uh, the, 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 than the worst scenario of the first wave in Stockholm. So Stockholm did have a lot of cases in the first wave. Now Malmo and Helsingborg are apparently worse than Stockholm was in the first wave. And Tobias finishes um, truly horrible at the moment. So that's from Sweden. Um, a rethinking preventative strategy in Sweden uh, could could be uh, appropriate. OK, so that's us for today. Thank you for watching, of course, as always. And uh, let's get through this next few weeks together and then things will start getting better. But the next few weeks are going to be worse.